Today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be here in Kentucky, the last day of this doctrinal conference. And I uh, ask you to uh, keep in your prayers. Um, this is uh, Patricia uh, Brackenberry, uh, the uh, grandmother of a large family that would have been here at the conference, who had to be anointed a few days ago, and who is now in the uh, near unto death. And so please keep her and her family in your prayers. And also, after the Mass today, of course, all are invited down to the, to the, uh, the, the meal and the remainder of the day uh, as in the, the activity and so on. The epistle for this fourth Sunday after Pentecost is taken from that of St. Paul of the Romans, chapter 8. Brethren, I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come, that we will be revealed in us. For the eager longing of creation awaits the revelation of the sons of God. For creation was made subject to vanity, not by its own will, but by reason of him who made it subject in hope. Because creation itself also will be delivered from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. For we know that all creation groans and travails in pain until now. Not only it, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption as sons of God the redemption of our body in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Gospel. Take that according to St. Luke chapter 5. At that time, while the crowds were pressing, pressing upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake Genezareth, and he saw two boats moored by the lake. But the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, the one that was Simon's, he besought him to put out a little from the land. And sitting down, he began to teach the crowds from the boat. But when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep, and lower your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, the whole night through we have toiled and have taken nothing. But at thy word, I will lower the net. And when they had done so, they enclosed a great number of fishes but their net was breaking. And they beckoned to their comrades on the other boat to come and help them. And they killed, came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the great catch of fish they had made. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. Henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left all and followed him. Thus for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Let's Today we have a double contemplation in the Holy Breviary. We read about the day that David went and fought Goliath. After 40 days of battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. And also today is a day we consider also in the gospel, the day that Peter began to join the fight. And a few considerations concerning this holy fight. What kind of day was it? This is emphasized many times by the Holy Church. What kind of day was it? It says, on the day that God visited 
Sodom and Gomorrah, it was bright. And Christ also said, on the day that he will come to visit the world, which shall be its final day, it will be also a bright day. They will be given in marriage. They will be burying and being born and dying. They will be going about commerce and do all manner of things that they do every single day. And Christ also said, if you only knew the hour or the day when the thief would come, you would surely be prepared. And then he revealed to us a dogma of our holy church. You do not know the day or the hour. <clears throat> we don't know the day or the hour of the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She shall have her victory over Satan. We don't know the day or the hour of our own death. We don't know the day or the hour of anything that has been predetermined by God. Of the events of today or of tomorrow. We don't know these things. What well, happened when David, who was a shepherd, and a young boy, and a forgotten one, he was so forgotten for multiple reasons. He was a seventh son, and his six brothers were stronger and tougher than he. He was a musician, and they were fighters, and tough guys, shepherds. But though he was a musician, he liked to play his harp, he liked to sing, he also loved the sheep. And one particular day he was given a mission, someone who doesn't know how to fight. Go to see how your brothers are doing. They're warriors. Today he would say, go and watch the documentary. Or go and watch the story of what's going on in the battle. Or if you're really brave, go and be a reporter. He was not going to fight. He was going to where a war was, but he was too young to fight. He had not been trained in combat. He knew he was going to a place where there was a war. He knew he was going to a place of a great battle, and he had visions of the battle. Young man comes to the seminary, he has visions of the battle. Young man comes to religious life, he has visions of the battle. <coughs> Bishop Thomas Aquinas used to say, the abbot of the monastery in South America, these young men come, they have visions of battle. And the visions are from the movies. And the visions are from romantic novels. And they have romantic ideas of what it is to be a soldier. Romantic ideas of what it is to go into battle. And they already know what they're going to see. Because we all know that when you go to battle, you're going to see bloodshed. You're going to hear cannons. It's going to be very exciting. It may be terrifying, but it will certainly be interesting. And David, the young boy, knew all about battle. He knew all about war, though he was not himself a warrior. He knew warriors carried swords. He knew they had shields. He knew they wore armor. He knew how they fought. And he was very proud of his older brothers because they could fight. All David could do was sing. All he could do was play a harp. And somebody had to watch the sheep. Now what are the sheep for an army? In olden times, the sheep were always brought along, and the goats were brought along, and the cows were brought along with an army because they didn't have MREs, meals ready to eat, non-food chemicals in a plastic bag ready to be consumed by people who don't know what food is. 
They didn't have MREs. They didn't have K rations. So in the old days, they did discover, however, soldiers do need food. This was something generals realized. An army marches on its belly. An army fights with its arms. An army fights with its swords. But it marches on its belly. So somebody has to bring and take care of the sheep. Somebody has to take care of the goats. So when the main soldiers go to war, the ones that are weak, the ones that are wounded, the ones that cannot fight, these ones watch the sheep. David is such a one. He walks to that place of the battle and he is excited because he has a boring life. He sings to his sheep, they don't appreciate the music. He washes his sheep, takes care of his sheep. They're not very bright, very predictable, but he does his job. Then he arrives at the battle. And the book of Kings tells us how David was excited. So when a young man comes to the seminary, a young man comes to the monastery, when a young one gets baptized and enters the fight of the supernatural battle against the devil, he's excited. He's ready for war. He's ready to fight the devil. He's ready to combat hell. He was excited. When he arrived at the battle, he said there was a battle going on, and he listened for the cannons, and he listened for the screams of battle, and he looked for the wounded being brought to the back lines. He didn't see any wounded. He didn't hear any battle. He said, maybe I arrived too early. Or even the battle was over, and we've already won. He went to the camp, and he saw no signs of conflict. Now, why is this? Because he didn't know what war was. When you get baptized, when you go to the seminary, when you get married, you don't know what war is. You have all kinds of visions, all kinds of pictures, and all kinds of good information from the movies, and don't forget about the documentaries on the subjects. But you don't know what war is. David did not know what war was. He walked into that camp and he listened for the sounds of war and he looked for all the signs. <coughs> what he saw was quiet men. He saw very depressed individuals. Now the battle had gone on for 40 days. Now what's interesting about this battle, notice what the sacred scripture says, and it's the Holy Ghost speaking. The sacred scripture says, For they had been in battle for forty days, and the camp of Israel stood against the camp of the Philistines, and the camp of the Philistines stood against the camp of Israel. There was a combat going on. There was a war the entire time. And the Philistines didn't know it. And the Jews didn't know it. Because they were looking for the wrong signs of combat. And they were looking for the wrong kinds of weapons to be used in war. They were not understanding what this war was about. And David was no different. When David walked into that camp, there were no signs of the battle that he thought that there would be. So he asked what was going on. Did not take long to see what was happening. Goliath came down for the 40th consecutive day. Now remember this about these 40 days. It is exactly 40 days when the Goliath came. It will be exactly 24 Sundays before Jesus Christ comes again at the ending of the world on the day of judgment. There will be a precise day when the Blessed Virgin Mary decides to crush the head of the serpent and we have our present victory. But what did a God reveal to us 
two things. On the one side, the day is already chosen. But the decision is already made, and he will not change his decision. Very similar to an example we mentioned sometimes. The Battle of Little Bighorn. Montana, when Custer's, General Custer's brigade was wiped out. They were trapped into a fight between all those small hills. They did not know how many thousands and thousands of Indians they were going to meet. They were surrounded by a crazy horse, and they were wiped out. There was a sergeant who was going to escape. On his horse, he broke through the lines of the Indians and he was riding away and crazy horse himself and about 12 to 15 braves chased him And he was escaping from the battle and As he rode off from the battle Crazy horse decided let that man live He will go and tell of our victory Let him live and he commanded the other braves with him to stop their horses. And he raised his hand and they all pulled back to stop. It was at that exact moment when Sergeant Jacoby turned around to look at the Indians behind him. He saw a wave of Indians behind him. And he thought there was no escape. They were still coming after him. He reached into his saddlebag and he pulled out his pistol. He put it against his own face and he blew his own brains out. He thought it was over. And he was right. It was. He was one step away from being a hero. He was one step away from being the subject of all the movies about that little bighorn. And all the stories, the sergeant that escaped the battle. And Crazy Horse decided to let him live. They pulled up. They watched the man pull out his pistol, thinking he would at least try to die with a brave fight, and they were going to definitely let him go then. They watched him blow his brains out. They turned back and killed the remainder of the cavalry of Custer. They cut the sinews of the arms and the legs of every soldier except one. They plundered the bodies of every soldier except one. They did not touch his body. So when the American soldiers came back, they found all the cut bodies of the dead. And they cut their bodies because the Indians said, when these brave warriors go into the next life, they can still fight. And therefore we cut their arms, we cut their legs, that they may not fight. And they stole all of their plunder. They took everything from them. Because these brave soldiers were warriors. Not one Indian touched one thing on, on Jacoby. And it's interesting that the American soldiers that picked up his pieces, they kept them from being destroyed, but they saw no value in them either until 2000 and something when his flag battle flag was sold for over a million dollars it became valuable in recent years the relic of little big horn jacoby didn't know and we must remember as the fathers of the church remind us time and time again you don't know we don't know the day in which we are chosen to have the victory. We don't know the moment. In fact, Crazy Horse said, let him live. And it was after that moment that he committed suicide and sent himself out of glory in this life. Most people don't know his name. And out of glory in the next life, he is damned. He lost on both sides of the veil of death. There are millions and millions and millions of such souls. 
when David went into that camp, what did he carry? Our Lord Jesus Christ said multiple times, what you do to these least of brethren, you do unto me. Watch and pray, lest he enter into temptation. When he comes, he better find us working. He better find us fighting. Everyone knows that there is no excuse in our backing down, as we all are accustomed to do. And the devil is trying to get us to say, you've run enough. You fought long enough. The army is wiped out. You fought and you fought and you fought. You can't continue to fight. We must continue to fight. And what about David? He did not know when he saved his sheep from a lion and killed him. He was preparing for war. He didn't know when he saved his sheep from a bear, he was preparing for war. He didn't know when he was singing his heart that he was preparing for war. Because what is the preparation for war? It is the preparation of the heart. There must be a drive and a spirit inside of our hearts to be attentive to the needs and the situation of every day. We are in a time now where God is judging who shall be the what. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to the, to the water, and there were two boats moored by the lake. St. Ambrose says there, in fact, are three boats. There are two different boats. There's the boat of St. Matthew and the boat of St. Luke, and both of them were the boat of St. Peter. We read the Gospel of St. Luke today. Our Lord Jesus Christ went to the shore. And what did he find? They were cleaning their nets. They had labored all night. And it was the morning. And they were cleaning their nets. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were fulfilling their daily duties. They did not know this is the day. They were going to change occupations. Now this is the day in which they were going to stop being fishers of fish, and they were going to begin to become fishers of men. Know what our Lord Jesus Christ says on this day after St. Peter says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And our Lord says, I will make you a fisher of men. In other words, you are not yet a fisher of men. You need to follow me for three and a half years. You need to survive the religious life. You need to survive the seminary. You need to survive a few years in the battlefield. You need to experience and hear the things that I have to say to you. You need to experience the pain of battle. You need to understand what it means to be a follower of me because it means to take up your cross and follow me. We were all trained to run across a field, be light, but our Lord says, run across the field carrying a cross. It will be heavy. You will see other sprinters sprinting across the field. But you will sprint with a cross on your back. You will drag it along. They will sprint freely. You will be exhausted. They will not have obstacles. You will have every conceivable and inconceivable obstacle. And they will not be the obstacles that you expect the day you enter marriage. They won't be the obstacles you expect the day you enter the seminary. They won't be the obstacles you expect the day of your baptism. For well, these are the obstacles of principalities and powers and the lords of this darkness. They are not the obstacles of men who can only bring out a few bullets and a few beatings. They're the obstacles of principalities and powers. And what is the principality and power trying to do? These devils. They are trying to change our hearts from hearts that know, love, and serve God to hearts that know, love, and serve self. They're trying to transform our hearts that are supposed to be hearts that obey God by loving His creation. 
and taking care of the welfare of our neighbors and fulfilling the responsibility that we have inside the army of Christ. David's job was to take care of the sheep. Someone had to take care of the sheep. He was to sing a few songs. Somebody had to sing. He sang well. He died rather than lose any of his sheep. He loved his sheep. He was forgotten by his family. Now why was he forgotten? The fathers give us some reasons. Because remember when Samuel came and said, Isaac, one of your sons must be the new king. He was very happy. And he got his six sons. And the six sons came. Oldest to youngest. And Samuel said, not him, not him, not him. It's none of these. Do you have any other sons? And Isai had to think. Oh yeah. Yeah, I've got another son. The youngest. But he's a little bit unusual. Go find him. And they had to go find him. Why did they have to go find him? And why did they forget that son? Because David's responsibility was take care of the sheep. And where was David? Always with the sheep. His care was always for the sheep. Lions hunt at night. David was not at home at night. David was watching the sheep at night. David was caring for the sheep at night. David was caring the sheep during the day. David was singing his beautiful music, but it was not heard by his brothers. It was not heard by his family. He sang in the wilderness. He sang in his work. It says in the sacred scripture, Work out thy salvation. And when God made Adam, he told him right at the very beginning, he gave him responsibility to work. Work out thy salvation. And it is interesting, one of the great dogmas of the Satan in the last 500 years is the Protestant dogma of you don't need to work. Where does government handouts come from? Martin Luther. That's where it comes from. Martin Luther said, we don't need to work. All we have to do is believe. We don't need to work. Now, this demonic teaching of Martin Luther spread throughout the Catholic Church. It spread inside of our hearts down the last 500 years. And it was very important for this lie, among many other lies, to be put inside of our hearts because the devil is afraid of workers. This is the duty of man. He must work. The duty of woman, she must be a mother. That is her work. That work is continual without break. Men must work. Their work often has breaks, but they must work. What is the work of David? About what did he sing? He sang the, the words that we read in the 150 Psalms. He sang the words which St. Benedict called the Opus Dei. In modern demonic times, they created an organization by Jose Escriva called the Opus Dei, which has nothing to do with Opus or Dei. Nothing to do with real work or God, but Benedict. He took monks and he put them in a monastery. And he said, get to work. Eight times a day, get to work. And why did he say that? Because he read the music that was sung by a shepherd. 1,000 years before Christ was born. That music is our work. St. Benedict called the Holy Bravery 
the Opus Dei. When a young man begins his journey to the Holy Priesthood, ordained a subdeacon, case of our three young men that are not able to be ordained subdeacons on the day they should have been ordained, they took the vow anyway. They took the vow of chastity, perpetual chastity, and they took the vow of saying the Holy Bravery, the Opus Dei, every day for the rest of their lives. Because if you're going to enter the supernatural battlefield, you have to work. And this is the first work, and the one that matters, the work of talking to God. Fathers tell us, and the ancients tell us, before the Renaissance, prayer is work, man is a worker, woman is meant to be at home, woman is meant to take care of the babies and be a mother, man is meant to work. Therefore, it is the responsibility of man to pray. Woman must also pray, but it is first the responsibility of man. He must pray. And his prayer cannot be only for himself. His prayer must be for his family. It is important that children see daddy on their knees. It is important that the priest of God is praying and kneeling in the church. It is important that every day we do our work. He who works is ready for battle. You can, tra you can train all the karate chopping you want to train. You can train on the special machine guns. You can train on all modern weapons. They won't work when you fight against principalities and powers. They're useless. The devil is terrified of workers. They could not find David. They even forgot that he was their son because he was just never there with the family. He was always with the sheep. He was always working. He was always busy. And he was once given another job. Go and see how the battle is going. So he went to see how the battle is going. And one day we'll be told, go and see how the battle is going. One day Peter, Simon Peter, was washing his nets. Another day he said, let's go fishing. And on these two days, he did not know that he would meet Jesus Christ. He didn't know on the first day, he would be told, you will be a fisher of men. He didn't know on the last day, when he swam from his boat to the shore and caught 153 fish, that Christ would tell him what it means to work, what it means to feed the sheep, Therefore he said, Simon, son of John, I have tested thee the last three and a half years. Thou hast made many mistakes. I want to know one question. And I want to know the answer to it from your own mouth. And this had better not be the day you start doing checking your cliff notes. This had better not be the day in which you try to cram before the test. Because I didn't tell you the day was the day of the test. You didn't know it was the day of the test. You never knew you would see me again. Fifteen days after the resurrection. Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? <coughs> yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. How does he know? So many times they have spoken before. He has lived with Christ every day for three and a half years. Though he has made so many mistakes, he has always been with Christ. This is not his first day. We must understand in our supernatural fight, one day the comedy is going to come to arrest us. One day they're going to come to say, it's time for you to join the army. On that day, we had, better, we had better be already well-trained and practiced warriors. 
What about the Jewish army? What about the Philistine army? Neither of them were warriors. The Philistines were whips on one side, and the Jews were whips on the other side. And they all had swords. And they all had armor and so on. But Goliath, he was a soldier. And Goliath knew what the fight was. He knew that if you're going to fight for a kingdom, you fight one man against all. You fight one man against the whole kingdom. You represent the kingdom with all your being. And if you want to be a fighter, be big, be strong, and practice killing people every day. And that's what Goliath did. He knew how to be a warrior in the kingdom of Satan. He also knew that the warrior of Satan he wins not only with his sword. For Goliath was very large, but he was not a fool. We often have the idea that a big man is an idiot. Goliath was not an idiot. He knew the importance of psychological warfare. He knew how to intimidate. He knew that even though he was a big man, a little one could kill him. And he knew that the way that he would defeat his enemies was 90% making his enemy believe that he was already defeated and having complete confidence in his own satanic kingdom. And that's what Goliath did, the tall man of pride who stood ten feet tall. His head would hit the bottom of a basketball rim. He was ten feet tall. Scripture tells us his height. He was filled with great strength, but he was also intelligent. He knew what real war was, and he fought for Satan. The other Philistines, they were afraid. They were the mediocre warriors of the kingdom of Satan. And the Jews, they were afraid. And they were the mediocre warriors in the kingdom of Christ. They stood against each other for 40 days. One reason they stood against each other for 40 days is because the day of the battle is always going to be the last day. And we will have to have seen that we stood for the 40 days. The Ten Commandments and the four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude must be multiplied together. And we must stand for 40 days. So what is essential in the seminary? Young men must say their prayers. We've had a lot of busy days in the last week or so, a couple of weeks. Late nights and early mornings. You better pray. You make sure you're always doing your opus dei, the work of God. Be attentive to the others. Make sure that those that are out in the field working and aren't able to make it back for lunch, they got food. Be attentive to the guests. Make sure they're taken care of and seated, etc. Don't waste time with yourself. Be attentive to the things that need to be accomplished and work all day and work all night. One day, God will say, this is the day that you will be a martyr. This is the day that you will receive your glory. This is the day of the combat Remember when David walked in, he had no plan to fight, he had no weapons, and he was not finished with his correct understanding. He did not understand. And though he did not understand, he was like St. John the Apostle. St. John the Apostle, on Holy Thursday night, he did not understand. He didn't know it was the Last Supper. He didn't know it would be the last time he could have a long three-hour conversation with his Lord and Master. He didn't know it at all. He didn't even know that he would rise from the dead after he died. But he knew that he loved Christ. And he knew that he had put his head upon his heart. And he knew to be attentive to all things that he does. And therefore, he was ready. Also remember this about the temptations of the devil. Fathers tell us, the devil does not know the exact moment of his defeat. But he has an idea of the approximate time. And when that time is near, 
He ups his temptations. He makes them go higher and higher. He makes them go harder and harder. Because he knows if you persevere another gallop, if you persevere another trot, like Jacobus, Sergeant Jacobus should have done, you will become a hero. I've got to get you to despair before that next trot. I've got to get you to quit before that next trot. I've got to get you to believe that you cannot escape, that you cannot win, that you must be defeated, that you will be tortured, and therefore end it all. Right now, since this coronavirus thing started, due to economic reasons and isolation, there's been a massive increase in suicides throughout the whole world. They're giving up. They're quitting. This is what the devil wants. Whenever his, the victory of Christ is about to come, he ups his temptations to quit. This is the most normal thing in the world. We must continue the opus day. Talk to God every day. Make sure that prayer is the heart of our lives. Do the works of charity in our own house, in our own place, where we are. And bear with the tribulations of our neighbors. Because there's no one more difficult to deal with than your closest neighbor. Your enemy lives in another country. He's easy to deal with. Meet him on the battlefield and stab him. Occasionally he stabs you. But your friend that you live with every day, your neighbors you live with every day, their knives and their wounds and their cuts, they cut much more deeply. You want to be tough in battle? You want to be able to stand up under torture? Then bear with the torture of your closest neighbor. Oftentimes it's called the wife, or it's called the husband, or it's called the brothers in the religious life, or it's called the friends, or it's called the, 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 the whoever the closest, the superiors, the inferiors that we live with. Let those closest neighbors cut. Let those closest neighbors wound and stand strong. Then you will learn how to be a warrior, as David did. And then one day he goes into the battle and he, and he discovers Goliath. What was in the thought of David that was not in the army? Goliath said, send one of your warriors down here and I will defeat you and defeat your God. And David said, which one is going to fight? And he discovered it was the 40th day. He said, anyone can defeat that man, for he represents Satan. We fight for the true God. It doesn't matter how big you are, how strong you are. Recognize that our God gives the victory, not our arms, not our mouths, not our, not our, not our, our being. God gives the victory. And he will not allow us to be defeated by this proud Goliath. He then made us the final mistake. He allowed them to put armor on him. He allowed them to put a sword on him. And then he was wise. I can't walk with this. I don't know how to swing a sword. I was not trained in this. I only know how to be a shepherd. And my weapon is five polished stones. My weapon is a sling. And I run like a shepherd light through the battlefield. I'll fight the way I know. What about the sword? Goliath has a sword. I'll use his. When that time comes, he ran into the battlefield and he won the day. With the five polished stones, the fathers tell us, these are self-sacrifice. The five wounds of the cross of Christ. Sacrifice for the good of the name and, the, and to, to maintain the glory of God and his kingdom. The sacrifice to maintain the open state and the good of the neighbor. And he went into that battle and he quickly defeated Satan. We ask the grace in our little battle of Catholic tradition. Persevere. One more day. Persevere. One more trial. One more step. Realize, as the world gets worse, it means the Blessed Virgin Mary's prophecy is about to be fulfilled. And when it is the darkest hour, that is when I will have my victory. Therefore, continue in the trial, continue in the fight. Don't be discouraged with the number of enemies that surround us and follow us. But fight boldly and bravely, especially with the opus vein, the holy bravery, the 
holy rosary, a holy speaking to God in our daily combat against Satan. Good luck to you all. Father, Son,